It's January 20th, 2019. We're at the Superdome in New Orleans where the Saints and Rams are in overtime, battling for a trip to Super Bowl 53. Greg Zerline is setting up for a 57-yard field goal attempt, a kick that, if made, wins it for the Rams. It ends the Saints season, and even worse, it would cement one of the most controversial outcomes in recent NFL history. To understand everything this kick represents, we need to rewind. Okay, hold up. Before we focus on this team, or this team, or this guy, we need to address the elephant that just entered the Superdome. The no-call heard round the world. With 1 minute 49 seconds left in the fourth quarter, things looked like this. Also a tie game, but Saints ball at the Rams' 13-yard line. New Orleans put themselves in the always enviable position where a first down here would let them kneel down a few times, kick a field goal as the clock expired, and pack their bags for the Super Bowl. That, without question, should have happened. Drew Brees, more on him later, looked for Tommy Lee Lewis. Rams corner Nikel Roby Coleman also looked for Lewis, and more importantly, did not ever look for the ball. The corner turned the Saints wideout into a physics problem, as Lewis spiraled through the air without having any chance of catching the ball. Rule 8, Section 5, Article 1 of the 2018 NFL Rulebook describes pass interference as any act more than one yard past the line of scrimmage that significantly hinders an eligible player's opportunity to catch the ball. If you prefer something more specific, Article 2-E says you can't cut off the path of an opponent by making contact without playing the ball. So feel like that might apply here. Shit could even warrant a flag for the hit being high. Anyway, our buddy down here in the corner just said incomplete, nothing more. The Saints sideline understandably couldn't believe it. Likely, no one watching this could. That said, there's still time on the clock. The Saints season is not yet over. But Saints fans right here aren't just thinking about the pain from earlier tonight. They're feeling something that's been building over time. The playoffs have not been the kindest to New Orleans. There's an above average sense of what could have been with these modern Saints dating back to 2006, the year they got a new head coach and a new quarterback. John Payton and Drew Brees were a perfect duo from day one. Their inaugural season in New Orleans saw them march to the franchise's first ever conference championship game, just one year after going 3-13. Then, just three years later, they returned to the NFC Championship, this time won it, then handed Peyton Manning his own ass on a platter in the Super Bowl. But the next year was Beastquake. And the next year was the Catch 3. Bountygate followed that, Marquez Colston's questionable chicanery followed that, then three seven and nine seasons seemed merciful in comparison to Stefan Diggs making the Saints defense look like children at the worst possible moment. This isn't an attempt to ruin the day of Saints fans. It's to show just how hard, how soul-crushing it can be to try and win a Super Bowl. The Saints have had many great teams under Peyton, but as the most important constant approached the end of his career, it became harder not to wonder if they should have won more. That made the 2018 season particularly interesting in New Orleans. Despite the heartbreaking end to 2017, this team displayed serious reason for optimism. Breeze's life became so much easier flanked by not one, but two Pro Bowl running backs from a year ago. One of which, Alvin Kamara, took home Offensive Rookie of the Year honors after a statistically absurd, I can do everything sort of debut. The Rookie of the Year on defense, also a saint. Marshawn Lattimore immediately headlined a secondary so young and talented, but tragically remembered for that. Breeze's latest go-to receiver, Michael Thomas, was coming off a Pro Bowl season, along with everyone else mentioned. In the eyes of people smarter than me, the Saints had positioned themselves nicely yet again, but how did it translate? Really, really well. I, I hope you figured that out since they made the NFC Championship. 
After a shocking Week 1 shootout loss to Tampa, New Orleans rattled off a 10-game win streak, their longest run since their Super Bowl season. Breeze seemed to break records just about every week. But most importantly, the Saints clinched the NFC's top seed with one week to go. They tried to make things fun in the divisional round by spotting Philly 14 points in the first quarter, but New Orleans shut them out the rest of the way to return to the NFC Championship for the first time since winning it all. It's an incredible season that's at risk of being all written off thanks to a single non-call. But no field goal is guaranteed, especially one from 57 yards out. The fact that the Rams are in this position, or here at all, should not be taken for granted. It's mainly thanks to this beautiful whiz kid. John McVay showed up in LA two years ago. In 2017, he coached the Rams to an 11-5 season, which already deserves to be put into context. Remember how Peyton and Breeze showed up in New Orleans and saved the day? Well, for the pre-McVay Rams, it had been 14 years since their last winning season. We're talking greatest show on turf era. After Tom Brady zapped their dynastic potential, coach after coach came through with similar results. Jeff Fisher stole the spotlight of ineptitude, but it ran far deeper than him. While they floundered, McVeigh made a dramatic splash into the coaching pool. He worked under the elder Gruden in Tampa before teaming up with Jay Gruden. McVeigh moved on to Washington, where he eventually reunited with Jay and really began to move up through the ranks. He hit offensive coordinator before he was 28 years old. His speedy rise came as the Rams grew sick of retreading the same names at head coach. LA took a chance when they made McVeigh the youngest head coach, not just in the league, but in the NFL's modern era. The Rams had watched McVeigh not only guide Washington's offense into one of the league's best, but also help develop Kirk Cousins into a potential franchise QB. The Rams needed both of those things badly. Their offense stagnated under Fisher's watch a fact made more troubling after they had used the top overall pick in 2016 on Jared Goff. The rookie quarterback mostly looked on from the bench in his first year, but when he managed to hit the field, Goff just looked unprepared. Some gambles are more necessary than others. And while this one paid out nicely in 2017, year two of McVay made it feel like a sure bet all along. Their offense torched the lead. They raced out to eight straight wins with Goff just hurling the ball all over the place. It helped having a runner like Todd Gurley by his side cranking out some monster rushing days. Robert Woods and Brandon Cooks both had 1,200 yard seasons, which helped the Rams become the NFC's number one offense. They put everything on display in a showdown with Kansas City. In what easily became the season's best game, Goff traded touchdown passes with Patrick Mahomes before LA's defense managed to put the game away for good with their second pick of the night. Probably the sexiest win of the Rams' impressive 13-3 season. But we're here, gridlocked at 23 apiece, and in New Orleans because of a different game. These two teams met right here back in week nine. Both offenses quickly took control of things. Kamara found the end zone on the Saints' incredibly efficient first drive. So Gurley answered with one of his own as the Rams moved the ball even more quickly. Very next drive, well, Kamara once again gave the Saints a seven point lead. And once again, that lead lasted for exactly one Rams drive. New Orleans scored 21 straight in the second quarter, so the Rams scored 21 straight of their own tying things up at 35 with 10 minutes to play in the fourth. It felt like two heavyweights just leaning into every punch thrown their way on a barge floating down the Mississippi. But the Rams ran out of gas. New Orleans kicker Will Lutz drilled a 54-yarder, then Breeze found Thomas for a 72-yard game-sealing score. Winning the head-to-head -head meant the Saints held the tiebreaker for home field advantage come playoff time. But this also meant both teams had a taste of each other and might be able to block a few punches in a rematch. Tonight, neither offense found things as smooth as before. They did trade blows with New Orleans scoring the first 13 points and the Rams answering with 10 before halftime, but they actually dodged punches this time. In their first meeting, 
Michael Thomas had been able to do seemingly whatever he wanted. But back then, Aqib Talib hadn't been around. Now healthy for the playoffs, the Rams' top corner helped clamp down on the receiver and drastically changed the flow. Neither defense would break, but the Saints came up especially big in the fourth. Thanks to a couple of deep shots from Goff, the Rams found themselves seven yards away from taking the lead. They chipped their way down to a third and two, but New Orleans continued to stand firm against the run, keeping C.J. Anderson out of the end zone and forcing the Rams to tie things up instead. What followed that? Well, the bad play. But the Saints did manage to take the lead with a field goal with under two minutes to go. So how did we get here? Well, it's finally time to talk about this guy. Greg Zerline has your normal kicker story in that it's so not normal. His college career began at University of Nebraska Omaha, but after Zerline had been kicking there for three seasons, they canceled the football program entirely. He then went to the equally well-known powerhouse, Missouri Western State University, where he just kicked the living piss out of the ball. Those numbers were good enough to be drafted in the sixth round. Like everyone else on the Rams, Zerline could only do as much as a Jeff Fisher squad allowed, but he did manage to show off that big leg. As a rookie, he kicked the second longest overtime game winner ever, three yards shy of Sebastian Janikowski's 57-yard record. He also drilled a field goal from 60 that year, a mark he topped a few years later. Once McVeigh came along, just like everyone else, Zerline profited. He got more chances to use that beautiful leg, often from a long way out, and found himself at the Pro Bowl. A groin injury held him back a bit in 2018, but he still proved capable of hitting from range, including a 56-yarder before halftime the first time the Rams visited New Orleans. And tonight, Zerline's already delivered one big kick for LA. After the Saints were forced to leave some time on the clock, the Rams still found themselves in another hole. A minute 41 and just one timeout left, LA needed Goff to pick up some ground. Starting off a bit hit or miss, he found Woods for a nice chunk, which put them at least in range for Greg the leg, but also forced them to use their final timeout. They managed to inch three yards closer, but that's all they got. Zerline trotted out for a 48-yard high-pressure kick, which he nailed, obviously. In overtime, everyone got a fresh start. The Saints began with the ball, which gave the refs an opportunity to say sorry via actually calling pass interference. Breeze had the chance to march his team down for a win, to make none of the last 30 minutes matter, but instead, oh, buddy, what are you doing? His first interception of the game at easily the worst time. The Rams got the ball just shy of midfield and picked up 15 yards, but the Saints' D didn't give up anymore. That presented LA with this chance. 57 yards. Yes, if there's any kicker in the league you'd want trying this, it's Zerline, but it's still a huge gamble. A miss here would give the Saints the ball at their 47, meaning they wouldn't need much to get into field goal range themselves. And you know Breeze doesn't have a second mistake in him if he gets another chance. He and Peyton have gotten so close to their return to the Super Bowl taking everyone in the Superdome on quite the journey as part of the process. But for those Saints fans watching, the freshest of wounds could potentially solidify into one more postseason scar. For LA though, this gamble would pay off incredibly well. It would cement their decision to go in a different direction as an amazing call. Just two years removed from mediocrity being the best case scenario, the Rams' aggressive nature makes this feel like the only way. 57 yards out, a trip to the Super Bowl on the line. Welcome to a moment in history. Bad snap. The kick is good. Rams win it. And on to Super Bowl 53, they go. I think no matter who you're a fan of, we can probably all agree that should have been a penalty on the Rams. So to offer the universe a little bit of a karmic balance, 
let me recommend this Rams Collapse. Uh, we've got plenty more stuff that I'm sure you'll enjoy, so please subscribe to Secret Base on YouTube, comment down below, and we'll see you soon.